Well, this morning we are examining the middle verses of chapter 4 of the book of Romans. Chapter 4, in the middle, is where we'll be. And chapter 4 as a whole is a study of the, the Old Testament patriarch of Abraham. And uh, more specifically, about the justification of Abraham. Uh, by faith, by grace, and, and by divine power. All three of those things are broken down in this chapter. And so, as we've seen in chapter 3, we know that a man or a woman is made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ and not through works. That Christ's sacrifice satisfied God's justice, God's judgment upon sin. And so... Christ offered to God the redemption in his blood that satisfied that demand of God's justice. And so when we, by faith, receive Christ, accepting his person and his work, and God then grants us Christ's righteousness, right, to pay the penalty for our sin. And the, the scripture clearly says that. Uh, when a person places genuine faith in, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then righteousness is in, imputed or credited to the account of the sinner, right? And, and you know, in, in this group and, and around it, you've heard that message a lot of times in your life. Salvation by grace through faith. And, and as we dig in and we go through some of this, you say, well, I know that. I hope as we go through some of these things, the goal is that we gain a better uh, understanding of the depth of God's grace, the, the understanding of the depth of what it means to truly believe and have faith, the, the wisdom of Scripture, so that when we encounter things in life, we can handle those things. But the wisdom of Scripture, that when we are sharing with somebody else that has questions and says, well, I try to be a good person, or I try to do this, or I try to do that to get to happen, that we have the wisdom and the knowledge to, to be able to share those things with them. So, so don't take lightly things when we talk about justification by faith last week and by grace this week as we look at that and do that. But, but dig deeper. You know that Michael Jordan talked about you know, the greatest basketball player that ever played. Then the most important thing was he spent hours on fundamentals <laughs> so that he would, so that he could be at his best. And so when we go back to these things, it's not just the, to, to go over um, things we already know, but it's to deepen our knowledge and wisdom. No, nowhere in our scripture does it, Christ say, read the gospel once, <laughs> or, you know, about that. But to be in the word over and over again, we're implored to be back, to be in the word of God. And so I hope you, you dig deep as we look in this. And uh, so in chapter four, Paul uses Abraham as this illustration of justification by faith. Um, we know that the wages of sin is death, and so they require a legal payment to pay that penalty, and that, that penalty was, has been paid by Jesus Christ. And if we receive that righteousness through faith in Christ, we are then right with God. That, that payment has been made, and so we are made right with God. We have probably all heard somebody along the way about say something about getting right with God or making their peace with God or do something like that. Well, folks, that should be an open invitation to go, really? How did you do that? Well, I gave this to that person, or I did that deal, or I said, this is, well, those are great things to do, but being right with God means receiving his righteousness through the blood of Jesus Christ. So when that opens the door for us to share a gospel message, um, in chapter 4 and, and verse 5, Paul told us that God justifies the who? The, the wicked or the ungodly, depending upon the translation you're looking at. God only saves the wicked. He only saves the people that come to him knowing they need a Savior, right? That was the problem. That's why the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees could never get it. <laughs> they thought they were all good, right? Because they kept all the rules. And it's like... And remember when, when Jesus said, I've come to want for those that are sick. <laughs> what do you mean? He meant somebody that was healthy was not? No, not somebody healthy is not, he's not here for, but somebody that thought they didn't need him, thought they were good enough to get into heaven. And he's like, no, <laughs> all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's, that's what he's talking about. In chapter 4, we have Abraham, who's his classic illustration, 
because, um, you know, the Jews, he was their hero. And we talked about last week that the, the rabbis taught the day that Abraham, it's because he was the best man available. He was the most righteous one. So God picked him to be the father of, it's like, no, Abraham, you can go through and see his sin and read the scripture, read the book, read in Genesis. His story is basically in chapter, what, 12 to about 26, I think, in Genesis or something like that. We see the things with Abraham. He made a lot of mistakes. He sinned. God chose him because he believed God. Scripture says he believed God's promises. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was his belief, his faith. They credited the righteousness. So this we see this in, in this chapter. Paul approaches from three perspectives. He says Abraham was justified by faith and not works. We saw that last week, especially in the first eight verses. Then he, Paul says Abraham was justified by grace and not the law. That's what we'll look at this week more. And next week he talks about Paul says that Abraham was justified by divine power and not by human effort. In the, in the last third of this chapter. So those are the, the themes, and they kind of overlap with each other, but, but uh, those are the basic uh, breakdown of, of chapter 4 that we see. Just, justified by faith and not works, uh, verse 3 kind of summed that up. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. We saw that. And so this morning we look at verses 9 to 17 of chapter 4. And he says, is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but it was before. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who, are also, who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value, and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He was our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. The key of this section is in verse 16. Really, it says, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us. Remember, anytime it talks about the circumcised and uncircumcised or of the law and not of the law, the division is the Jews and the Gentiles, the circumcised, the Jews, under the law, the Jews. Those not under the law are those uncircumcised, the Gentiles. And Paul's saying he's the God of everyone. He has this mixed audience here, primarily Jews, but also some Gentiles here. And he's telling them, <laughs> you know, that, that God is the God of everyone and that salvation is the same for everyone. Everyone comes to, to salvation by grace through faith. There's, there's not a, a one way for you guys and one way for you guys, one way for you, okay? It's all one thing. And that's the theme that we're seeing. Salvation is a matter of believing. It's not only through faith that, that's a free gift from God, which is an act of grace on God's part, that he gives us that faith to receive that gift, that he gives us that gift. 
Grace is an absolutely free favor to an undeserving, undeserving sinner. And it, we, God it bestows that to all whom would believe. Uh, Abraham was justified, made right with God, brought into that right relationship because he believed. It wasn't any of the stuff he did. It was his belief that, that God extended his grace to him. How is God gracious? Well, he gave him a promise, and that's the key. In verse 16, we see that word, and it talked about a promise. It was by grace that God offered Abraham a promise. And Abraham received that. Uh, that was his faith. So salvation is not earned. It's offered by God, an act of his grace, given to undeserving sinners. All right. And so uh, the beginning of the passage, we will back up now to verse 9. Paul establishes that Abraham was justified not by the circumcision. It, this is the first thing that the Jews, I said, learned about their salvation. This was their first thing. Well, we're circumcised, so we're good. We're going to heaven. We're saved. It's like, no, <laughs> that is not the deal. Uh, that is not how Abraham was justified. Uh, Paul shows in verses 9 to 12 that Abraham was declared right with God. And if you go back, that's why you need to go back and read that in Genesis. Abraham, it was declared right with God. It was 14 years after that that they did the circumcision. He was declared righteous. Circumcision didn't save him. He was declared righteous. He made that in the covenant, the promises. This is a sign or a seal of, of the promises, okay? So that has nothing to do about it. And, and that had to make the head spin of some of the Jews. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> no, he says that, that was 14 years later that that happened. Uh, he said, when, when the prophet, in the Old Testament prophet spoke, he says, it, it's, it's an outward sign to remind you that what God wants is a circumcision of your heart, cutting away the excess in your heart. It's like today we do baptism. Did baptism save you? No. But it's an outward sign, right, of what the Spirit has done inside you. You've, you've died with Christ and you're raised in newness of life. And he's Paul said, it's the same thing. It's an outward sign here. That's not what, it's not the saving there. The second thing that the Jews leaned on was the keeping of the law. Well, the law of Moses. We keep the law of Moses. We keep the rules. We're saved. We're God's chosen people. That's how we're saved. That's not it either. First, Paul says Abraham was not made right with God by his circumcision because he was circumcised 14 years after that, that promise. Second, he wasn't made right by keeping the law of Moses because the law of Moses didn't come for 430 years later. How could he keep a law that wasn't written yet, right? He says it wasn't that either. It was his belief in God's promises. It was his faith, his belief in God's promise that saved him. So all you guys think because of you have this symbol or because you you know the Torah and you keep, you know, you try to keep these laws that you're saved, but it's about the heart, the faith and belief that all of that comes back to. And uh, so he, he dispels those, uh, those things right away. Um, verse 13 of that says, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offering received the promise that he would be the heir to the world, but through his righteousness that comes by faith. And we're going to look here a little bit later uh, where it defines that even further. Um, if you look at the words, the promise, that are in the middle of verse 13, what is, what is the promise? Well, it's, it's the Abrahamic covenant, if you want to use the big, you know, the theological terms of the day, right? But it, it was given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when God repeated it again in chapter 15 and 18 and then again in chapter 22 of Genesis. They, they reminded them of that promise. But he said to Abraham, look, I want you to leave this city, right? The Ur, he's in Ur of the Chaldees. I want to leave and, and, and I want you to go to a, a land that I'm going to give you. He promised him a land, right? And, and I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have a son and be the father of nations. 
All right, so he's going to have, he's going to be promising them uh, a land, and he's promising him this huge descendants that'll be more than the sands of number of, of grains of sand upon the, the seashore, he said, uh, going on. And so those are really, really important, and especially with the fact that Abraham and Sarah, his wife, are both almost 100 years old at this point, and they don't have kids. <laughs> but he says, you're going to be the father of many of nations. They're like, that takes some faith. That takes some belief, doesn't it? It does in that. Uh, but there was another part of that promise that was there. Abraham saw beyond the promise of a son in Isaac and beyond be all of that, there was a promise of a spiritual reality in that. Because God said in that promise that all people will be blessed through you. He believed that God's, a God's promise of a redeemer that would come, that would bless everyone, that a descendant of his down through that line, somewhere along the way, there would be a redeemer. And uh, we knew that, that Abraham was believing in that because Hebrews 11 and 10 says that Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations who architect and builder is God. He was looking forward to that that city, that heaven, that those things. He knew there would be a redeemer. He saw a spiritual reality in addition to the physical reality of, of, a, of a land and a people. <laughs> There's a spiritual side of that. And so that's the, the spiritual blessing. That's the third part of that promise uh, in there. So uh, and when it talks about a father of many nations, well, first of all, in Abraham's father, not only of the Jews, in right, but also the Arab nations, Ishmael. <laughs> they, they, he, so from from that geographical standpoint and those heritages, he's a father of both. But it's much more than that. It's much more than that. A father of many nations, because Abraham is in essence the spiritual father of all that would show that faith to believe in the Redeemer. He's the spiritual father. Uh, also of that. So, so you know, the, the, uh, the Arabs will claim their father Abraham in, 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 their, in their religions. With Jews, they oh no, he's our father. <laughs> well, physically, yeah, descendants of both. But the, the important fact is that he's the, he's the role model of spiritual of the spiritual father, of one that receives God's grace and faith through his belief. And that's what we see. The answer comes in that, that fourth element element we've got uh, of, the, of the covenant, that, that the blessing to all of those. And, and if you're not sure about that, Jesus himself in John 8, 56 says, he's telling the Jews who were, who were coming against him, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day he saw it and was glad. He was looking forward to that Redeemer that would come. And, and so keep your finger there. We're going to go to Galatians for just a minute, chapter 3, and look at a few things. I'm going to challenge you. Go back and read Abraham's story in Genesis. But go back also with, with Romans. As we look at chapter 4, chapter 3 of Galatians is an incredible commentary. <laughs> that it helps give us depth to the things that Paul is teaching in Romans. Uh, Galatians 3, uh, 16 to 18 is where I want to start. And he says the promises, those promises given to Abraham he's talking about, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Watch that word, it's singular, seed, okay? The scripture does not say, and to seeds, plural, meaning many people, but to your seed, one, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with promise. It's right there. Where did I get 430 years? Well, you can go back in Genesis and count it up, or you can read Galatians 3, and Paul just does the math for us. It says 430 years later. 
It's really important when we look at this. Seed and seeds. God promised them that all would be blessed through his. He promised them a nation with great descendants, but he said that everyone would be blessed through his seed, singular. Not through his people, all the, all the descendants, but through that one that was going to come through his descendant, through Christ Jesus. It's important. He made, when, when God made that promise to Abraham back in Genesis, right, thousands of years before Christ was born, <laughs> that seed, that one, that promised redeemer is coming. Abraham, believe me for that. And Abraham did. Uh, same thing, Galatians chapter 3 down in verse 29 says, he says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Everybody has the same, like I said, the same salvation. Everything is through that same one. And uh, then if we flip back uh, up higher in the chapter to verse 8. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This was hard for the Jews to believe. Well, these Gentiles, these no good stinking Gentiles get the same salvation we get? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing new. Paul said, you guys are having a hard time with this right now in the first century, right? After Christ had... Uh, just, I mean, this is like 20 years after Christ has ascended to heaven. It's a short time after that. First century, Paul said, you guys are having trouble with this, but look, go back to Abraham. Go back and read it and see what it says. God promised this to everybody. Clear back there in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, so uh, amazing, amazing thing that it, we see in the prophecy and the promises that were given to that. You know, even Paul himself had tried real hard to be saved by all his works when he was still Saul, the Pharisee. Pharisee among Pharisees. He said, bragging, I'm out of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, um, circumcised on the eighth day, I keep the law, I do all of these things. I have this great education in theology, which he did. <laughs> and then Paul says, I count all that as rubbish. A better translation is manure. That's, that's like manure. It means nothing compared to the righteousness in Christ and, the, and for those that would believe in him by faith. So, okay, now you can go back to Romans and uh, chapter 4, verse 14. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless. If the law is what saves you, then faith doesn't do you any good. And the promises of God are worthless in believing by faith. But that's not the case, is it? <laughs> he says, see, you're looking at this wrong. You're looking at this wrong. If, if the original condition for salvation is the law, then faith is void and the promise is useless and everything collapses. And then what was the need for the cross? There was no need for Jesus to come <laughs> at all and put himself through everything he put himself through if they could be saved by the law of Moses. If your works and keeping the rules could save it, then Christ didn't need to come, let alone put himself through everything that he put himself through and, and going through that. And why can't the law save? Well, there's a lot of people that said, well, you know, I try to, I try to do good and keep the rule, I try to do right. Why do they want to do all this stuff? But you can't do it. We can't do it on our own. And, and even the people that were trying to check the boxes on all the rules. Remember Jesus came and, and, he, and he told them in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you guys are kind of checking the boxes on, on what you do on the outside. But I'm talking about how you feel on the inside. I've never murdered anyone. <laughs> okay, but you hate somebody in your heart? Yeah, that's the same thing as committing murder, right? Oh, Never had a, I've never had an adulterous affair. Okay, well, have you ever taken, lusted after somebody in your heart? Yeah, well, it's, see, it's about the heart. And so it, it, the law doesn't 
can't save you. The law shows us that we fail <laughs> in being righteous before God and that we need a Savior. That's the point of the law of Moses, of all the law, is to show us that we can't do it on our own. We need a Savior. We need a Redeemer that, that Abraham looked forward to in that, in that uh, promise. Verse 15 tells us that the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there's no transgression. Okay? The law brings wrath. We saw where the wrath of God was being back in, in chapter 1, right? Uh, poured out upon those breaking the law. The law brings wrath. You're breaking God's law. He says, where there's no law, there's no transgression. Hey, you can't do that. You're breaking the rules. I didn't know that rule. If I don't know there's laws against that, right? I, if, if I didn't know that I couldn't make a right-hand turn out of the far left lane on the right side, but I know that, right? The, it, the, law, the law says I can't do that. So now there's a law. If, there, if it wasn't written down somewhere saying you can't do that and you did that, they couldn't give you a ticket for causing an accident because there was no law. But there is a law. And so you've broken the law. He says, that's, that's it. The law shows us. Where there's no law, there's no transgression. Right? And uh, so we, we see that. Even in, in later on in chapter 7, Paul says, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law hadn't told me. I was alive apart from the law. I wasn't dead to sin because if I didn't know the law, I was just worried about me. But I know God's law. And he's given us his law. And so what we know when we break it. Uh, so Chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also of those who are the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. That's Paul's goal, like we said earlier, to get everybody to realize that everybody comes to Christ the same way, by grace through faith, believing in Jesus Christ and the work he did upon the cross and who he is, the promises, believing in the promises of God. That's where it comes. He's just getting it all into that. And he splits them into two categories. Not only of those who are of the law, the Jews we talked about, um, but then second he says, even those who are of the faith, the Gentiles. He says, don't, either way, it all is the same thing. Here's another thing. Paul is, is making the minds of the Jews just spin, okay, about this. Tell them, Abraham, it was 14 years after after the promise of God that he was circumcised. It was 430 years after that that the law came. So you guys, none of those things saved him. And then here's the other thing that comes down in this. Is Abraham a Jew or a Gentile? You ever think about that? <laughs> there were no Jews. When God called Abraham, that comes later. <laughs> that comes after that. He, he was a Chaldean Gentile. He was living in a pagan land when God called him out of that land, which also shows you something about the faith of Abraham. A God whom he didn't know. The Bible doesn't tell us how God came to Abraham, how he convinced him. The Bible doesn't tell us that. You can ask that again someday. All right, and, and ask Abraham someday when you get there. But he was a Chaldean Gentile whom God chose. <laughs> when does the nation of Israel come? Abraham, Isaac. It was Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's two generations later. Another thing that... God's grace and love and salvation is for everyone. And it was from the beginning. Always from the, even from the beginning. It was the same. Verse 17, I've made you the father of many nations. 
He is our Father in the sight of God because He is our spiritual role model. All right? In that. Verse 17 is incredible. You're talking about the faith of Abraham. Because Abraham believed in, the last half of verse 17 says, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Abraham believed that God could give life to the dead. He had seen it happen. When, when Isaac is actually born, Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90. In their body, their ability to reproduce was dead. That age. He didn't have any kids. He, he saw that firsthand. God brought life from the dead right there. <laughs> and he's believing in that. And he's believing in Redeemer. When he took Isaac, God said, through your, gen your descendants, there'll be that seed. He took Isaac up and he was, had the knife up. He was going to sacrifice him because God told him to do that. God could see that. When Abraham went up there, he, the scripture tells us that he believed in his heart. Oh, God tells me to do this. I know that I've got to have descendants through Isaac, but God tells me to do this, so I'm going to do this because I believe God's just going to raise him from the dead after, after I sacrifice him. He, he, had, he had that much belief in God's promises of the Redeemer that would come and all that was going to come, that he had faith enough, and when he got up there and God said, okay, I see your faith. Look over there. There's a ram caught in the thicket. Sacrifice it. That's what he wanted to see if Abraham truly believed. How much faith do you have? <laughs> do you believe that he brings life from the dead? So much so that, that you would do that. There's, that. He gives life to the dead. And, then, and the other thing, he makes something out of nothing. He talks about the creative power of God. He calls things that were as if they weren't. Because he can speak them into existence. And I think this points not only to God's creative power in this. The other thing we need to remember is in addition to God's creative power for creating man and the earth and the universe and all that kind of stuff. But he also speaks of God's ability to create events. To create history that brings about his will. We've talked about how... how Jesus, it was prophesied in all the prophecies hundreds of years and even thousands of years before he came and that every detail was prophesied about being in Bethlehem and that he was going to end up in Egypt and then he was going to be back and then he was going to be in all, in all the workings of everything and he used, he used pagans along the way to make all of those things happen. But that God's power, not in just creation, but in an ability to, for his will to move forward with man or in spite of man. Abraham was saved by grace because Abraham believed, because Abraham had faith, because Abraham trusted the promises of God. God's promises are without dispute. You can go through Scripture, and there's thousands of them that have already been fulfilled. Thousands of promises along the way. And there's a thousand more, and we can have faith and believe in all those things that are yet to come because we've seen what God has already done. And we can have faith in those promises. God promise, God's promise of a Redeemer, God's promise of an eternity in heaven, they're all given to us. How do we receive those promises? By faith. Because of the grace of God, He offers His promise to all the world to whom all that would believe. To all that have faith in the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know Him, receive that promise today. And perhaps you already know Christ as Savior. You believe in that Redeemer. But the question is, are you willing to believe the other promises of God for your life? We've got people who, who claim to be Christians and they're running around the world and their anxiety and worry is off the charts. Do you not believe God about His promises that I'll never leave you or forsake you? I'm with you always. That, that he's the great God of all comfort. Are you not willing to believe that? Are you not willing to, oh my gosh, all these things are happening. I don't know what I'm not going to do. 
his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. That's not just a song, that's, that's out of Matthew. <laughs> that, that the lilies of the field, and sparrow, that God takes care of all these things. He'll take care of you. Are you willing to believe those promises? Oh, I believe there's Jesus came and he's Redeemer. Are you willing to believe all of the other promises of God for your life? That's the challenge. That's the question. Father God, what an amazing passage we see from the Apostle Paul. 